Hi, my name is Sachin, and today I'd like to talk to you about our vision for a more inclusive and equitable digital mental health. I'll start off with a brief content warning. I highly urge you to take a look. Next, I'll also start with this quote, which I think summarizes the themes of this presentation really well. So many argue that there is a universally large gap in treatment for mental illness. So for example, as you can see in this map, one in every five people in the global north get the minimum standard of treatment for depression, while one in every 27 people get that same minimum standard in the global south. Given what's framed as a widespread treatment gap, digital mental health tools are also framed as one potential way to provide care. Popular media also frames technology and digital trace data as being a revolutionary solution to the widespread need for mental health care, even going so far as to say that it can solve crises. And we hear these terms everywhere, right? Mental health and mental illness. And though these terms have become ubiquitous, Definitions of mental health and mental illness have been used by institutions of power to exclude multiply marginalized people from care, infringe on human rights, and silence political dissidents. The veil of scientific objectivity that psychiatry has provided has often been used to justify oppression by state and medical actors who worked for colonial governments and link definitions of mental health to racist categories, such as the example of the African mind published by the WHO in 1953. Diagnostic scales used in digital mental health applications and HCI research have identity-based biases rooted in histories of racism and oppression, often originating in the work of colonial psychiatrists, such as Emil Kraepelin. More work is thus needed to investigate the conceptualizations of health and illness that underlie the design of digital mental health tools and understand whose needs those conceptualizations might marginalize. With this in mind, we ask the two following questions. How might current methods in digital mental health propagate historical power relations and patterns of oppression? And how might we design technology-mediated mental health methods and spaces that are fundamentally decolonial? In this work, we analyze the coloniality of three different applic popular application areas in digital mental health, interfaces that connect people in distress to resources, applications that evaluate or classify individual mental health, and applications created to predict or intervene in an individual's future mental health states. By moving from centering treatment to centering healing, we argue that a decolonial digital mental health can empower people experiencing mental distress to have much more agency over their care and well being. So, in this presentation, I'll begin by talking about the intersections between coloniality and computing and our vision for a decolonial digital mental health. I'll then talk about our analysis of the coloniality of three different digital mental health applications. Finally, I'll talk about what we mean when we talk about transitioning to designing for healing. But first, let's talk about coloniality, computing, and digital mental health. Recent work in HCI has explored the impact of colonialism and coloniality in computing. And what do we mean when we say coloniality? By coloniality, we mean the persistence of power dynamics influenced by colonialism, as well as the structures designed to uphold and propagate those power dynamics. Now, analyses of coloniality have been done in several spaces within computing, ubiquitous computing, computing broadly, artificial intelligence, and HCI we turn the same lens towards the emerging field of digital mental health. But to begin, we acknowledge the central role that land plays in oppression. We are conscious of the potential for our argument in this work to be complicit in colonization, and we explicitly affirm the fundamental role that land and resources play in coloniality. We choose to call our conceptualization a decolonial digital mental health to explicitly acknowledge the role of colonialism and coloniality in creating a mental health that prevents people from accessing care based on their own experiences and forces them to risk harm while in distress when trying to pursue care on their own terms. We urge researchers and practitioners to consider deeply how the design of technology-mediated support might propagate historical forms of marginalization and power dynamics that rob individuals of agency over their care. And we urge researchers and practitioners to think more broadly about what might bring healing to individuals rather than the treatment of specific symptoms, centering cultural validity and medical pluralism. I'll now talk about uh, our analysis of the coloniality of different digital mental health tools. To illustrate how power dynamics have been addressed in the past, outside of technology, we include analysis of moments in history with implications for digital mental health, including a study of T. Lambo's work to reform the Nigerian psychiatric system during decolonization, global psychiatric survivor movements, and the international production of racist knowledge in psychiatry. I highly encourage you to read about it in the paper. But here, I will summarize our main arguments when we analyze the coloniality of our chosen application areas. I'll begin with personal interface design. 
In our paper, through an analysis of T. Lambo's work and psychiatric survivor movements, we argue that digital mental health apps should fundamentally include voluntary interactions with care, the ability to end care at any time, agency over care and recovery, mutual interactions with various sources of aid, including those from both biomedical and community-based institutions. We endorse a medically plural approach or supporting the coexistence of mul multiple medical subsystems. Now a brief content warning, the next slide does contain a racist graphic from the 1970s. So in analyzing how classification and measurement happen in digital mental health apps, we also caution designers to be conscious of the biases embedded in the metrics they use, including the gender and racial biases that are endemic to the history of psychiatry, stemming from mental health and illness as a tool of oppression. You can even see racism being used to sell antipsychotics in, in this ad from the 1970s. We encourage designers to instead leverage culturally valid constructs, including creating those constructs from scratch based on how participants experience and prioritize distress. Finally, we note the risk of passive data and social media data being, becoming, like Foucault argued, the chains of the asylum become, tools of surveillance. Given the immense benefit and even empowerment that many find through engaging with mental health content, we argue that there needs to be safety and consent inbuilt into these tools, including a focus on accountability, transparency, explainability. So what does it mean to design for healing? Approaches to a decolonial digital mental health are highly rooted in local context. We make simple suggestions here how we might move from a treatment focused context to a healing focused model, but note that each may or may not work for a given context. We urge designers, researchers, and practitioners to center lived experience, center power relationships, and center structural factors in their work. I list particular examples of how one might do that on this slide. We believe that centering these factors influenced by the colonial history of mental health can lead to a digital mental health that is more inclusive and equitable for all people. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for coming to this presentation. I highly look forward to your questions as well as um, seeing you at, at Kai. Thank you so much.